welcome to another lecture of Econ 2301, Principles of Macroeconomics. In this lecture, we will cover Chapter 9, Aggregate Demand and Aggregate Supply. So up until now, we've just focused on very classical models of economics in which prices adjust freely in the economy. Today, we're going to look at what happens when prices are not as flexible and they're somewhat sticky. When prices are sticky, that means that there's a lack of full wage and price flexibility. In other words, the price levels or wage levels won't adjust to what's going on in supply and demand, and they may take some time to adjust. For instance, sticky wages cost sticky prices, and because of this, they hamper the economy's ability to bring demand and supply into balance. Sometimes we will see a sticky price lead to wealth, and we're going to look at that in just a second. Other times we see a decrease in wealth because of this. For instance, if I got paid a million dollars an hour, I would be very, very rich. However, if gasoline went up to two million dollars per gallon, I would not be that rich because my wage is very sticky it would need to adjust really quick in order to make up for that balance. We're going to look at things when that occurs or times when that occurs and what happens. For most firms, the biggest cost of their business, the biggest expense is labor or wages. If wages are sticky, and they typically are, this means that the firm's products will have to be somewhat sticky. They can't just lower their prices continually because they have to pay their labor. In the short run in macroeconomics, we define it as a period of time in which prices do not change or they change very little. In general, workers and firms let demand determine the level of output in the short run. Firms often negotiate long-term contracts. The reason why they do this is so that they can have that peace of mind and continuity knowing that a worker is going to stay there for quite a while. But because of this, they're not able to adjust their prices that frequently. Remember that a firm is going to operate where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Let's say, for example, my personal contract is for one year at South Plains College. Now, let's say that very few economic students sign up for courses at South Plains College. Well, the amount I'm getting paid will not go down because I've already signed that contract. As long as my classes make, even if they barely make, and I have the minimum amount, I will get paid my base salary. Now, tuition should probably go up because there aren't very many people signing up or actually go down, vice versa, which way you look at it, if they want to supply the same amount, then the tuition should actually go down in order for the demand to increase. And therefore, you all would probably see a decrease in tuition so more people would sign up. However, in the very short run, if we wanted to make up the difference and we wanted to still make up my salary, the only thing that South Plains College could do would be increase tuition in order to make in that particular first semester, marginal benefit equal marginal cost, they need to increase tuition. Now it doesn't work that way. So I, I would be getting paid a little bit more to do less work than I would have been if my classes were full. Now let's flip it on its side or on its head, this example, and say what if I had more classes and more students than I was actually required to. Now I may get a little extra pay because of what is written in my contract, but I won't double my income. It's impossible for me to. However, what if I doubled the amount of classes I was teaching? Essentially, the firm or business would be paying me a lot less per class than what they wanted. And this is because wages are very sticky. Understanding the aggregate demand curve. Well, what is the aggregate demand curve? 
The aggregate demand curve is a curve that shows the relationship between the level of prices and the quantity of real GDP demanded. Notice it says real GDP demanded. If you look at figure 9.1, you will see that this equation or this graph is aggregate demand and what it is is if we took, and it's very similar to our own individual demand curves, if we took everybody's demand curve, let's say my demand curve plus your demand curve plus this demand curve, and we added all of the demand curves together, we would get aggregate demand. So what are the components of aggregate demand? Well, if aggregate demand is a component of real GDP, then the components are just those that make up GDP. And if you'll recall, recall the equation for GDP, it's Y equals consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. And I apologize for my sloppy handwriting. Each one of these make up aggregate demand. And what we can do is take various variables and try to shift out aggregate demand in order to increase the overall production and output of the economy. So why does the aggregate demand curve slope down? Well, this is because what matters to people is real money, the real value of money. If you'll recall, the real value of money is the purchasing power, the amount of money I can buy. Most people will often talk about how much money you make in a particular job versus another job. What they often leave out is the fact that if you live in Texas, your money goes a lot further than if you live in New York. This is the real versus nominal principle. This is very vital and important for economics because we want to increase real GDP. We don't want to just increase nominal GDP. In that previous slide, if we increase GDP or aggregate demand and overall GDP and it was just nominal, what would happen is we would go like this to this point right here and although we see an increase in output we also see an increase in price you see the price right there where we uh, hit the y-axis actually goes up and therefore we don't actually see an increase in wealth so what is wealth well, the wealth effect is one of the ways in which we can see the demand curve getting affected. The wealth effect is an increase in spending that occurs when the real value of money increases, but yet price levels fall. For example, if I were to get a raise or get paid a little bit more, more and Taco Bell had a sale on their tacos, Mr. Kemper would see a wealth effect. We want to see wealth effects. This is when we have an increase in real income, remember it's purchasing power, and at the same time prices go down. The interest rate effect. This is another way that we're able to affect aggregate demand. With a given supply of money in the economy, a lower price level will lead to lower interest rates. John Maynard Keynes was the first person to really look at this and he did so right after the Great Depression and this is essentially what develops into the modern day democratic view or uh, the Democrats view more liberal view on interest rates and the money supply what they're trying to do and most Democrats argue is that if interest rates are low enough we will see an increase in spending this kind of makes sense. What it states is that lower interest rates will lead to more purchasing, more spending, because it's cheaper to spend. Think of it this way. 
if I have a credit card that has a 0% interest rate and I have a credit card that has a 5 to 10% interest rate, I would probably spend more money on the 0%, hopefully, ceteris paribus, than I would on the 10%. This is because it's cheaper to spend, it's cheaper to borrow when I use that cheaper credit card. Businesses are the same way. If I am taking out a loan to pay employees and the interest rate is cheaper, that employee is cheaper. However, if the interest rate is much higher, that employee becomes more expensive. The final effect that we see to aggregate demand is the international trade effect. And this is when we see an open economy. And classical economists, as well as most Keynesian economists, argue that we need to have essentially as much of an open economy as possible. Therefore, we can trade with other countries. This means that we'll have more competition within our own company. For instance, if I can buy a t-shirt in the United States from company A or a t-shirt from China, company B, if they're competing against each other, I'm going to have the lowest price. However, if company A is the only company that exists, they can set the price wherever they want. If you need a real life example of this, look at Lubbock Power and Light, LPNL, and see that they don't have any competition. The worst thing that could happen to LPNL and the best thing for the local economy is for them to have some competition. We wouldn't have the argument over whether their prices are too, um, too high and whether they are price gouging because the competition would lower the overall price. This is the trade effect. Now this is where we're going to put it all together and we're going to show you, illustrate why um, Democrats argue the things that they argue. In the next chapter or the next lecture, we'll actually look at the other side, which is the supply side of the economy and what they argue. But let's look firstly at changes in the money supply. An increase in the supply of money will increase aggregate demand and shift the aggregate demand curve to the right. In other words, what we are saying is if more people have money, then they will spend more money on various goods because we know that prices are going to be somewhat sticky. Now, if you're a classical economist, you will say that if we just increase prices or increase our own wages, the amount of money in the economy, then price levels will correspond and reflect that. A change in tax. Democrats argue that a decrease in tax will increase aggregate, aggregate demand and shift the aggregate, aggregate demand curve to the right. Essentially, by arguing this, what they're saying is that you'll have extra amount of money, and I'll look at, we'll look at this graphically and I'll show it to you on the screen in just a second. But if you have a decrease in tax, you're increasing your real income. And as long as price levels stay the same, you have a wealth effect. Finally, changes in government spending. What we're seeing here is the G portion of aggregate demand. At any given price level, if they increase government spending, and as long as, and this is very important, and I don't necessarily think that this happens all the time, but as long as prices stay the same, we'll see an increase in overall spending and therefore an increase in wealth.
understanding the aggregate demand curve continued, you might see a little glitch in this lecture. That's because I had a knock on my door. Anyways, what I was talking about was government spending. And at any given price level, an increase in government spending will increase aggregate demand and shift it out to the right. As long as prices stay the same, we will see a wealth effect. So let's illustrate this and what we're talking about. Essentially, what Democrats tend to argue is that if we have a decrease in taxes, I'm going to use a highlighter, sorry about that, a decrease in taxes, we will see aggregate demand shift out to the right because we have an increase in income. Well, if my prices stay the same, and I'm going to say this is P1, and on my um, aggregate demand curve, on the p-axis, if it hits right here to begin with, I will have this amount of output or this amount of GDP. Remember, aggregate demand is overall GDP, so we'll say that's Y1. If price levels stay the same, we'll hit the aggregate demand curve right there. And it will intersect at the point of Y2 which is an increase in overall GDP. GDP goes up. Now, an increase in government spending will do the exact same thing as long as this price level right here stays the same, as well as an increase in the money supply. Just think of it this way, if the amount of money is increased and your income increases but prices stay the same you have the ability to buy more of particular goods however the problem with this theory and I'm gonna point it out here just because I think it needs to be pointed out is that prices tend to increase sometimes especially in a, in a very efficient economy and let's say that if we increase it this way, we'll have a direct impact parallel or corresponding to the increase in aggregate demand. And if the direct correlation leads to the exact same percentage increase of output as in price, we'll have a sum zero gain. In other words, let's say it was like right there prices increase and output only increases by the same amount from here to here as from here to there. Uh, output increases the same amount as price increases. All you need to know as far as this exam or this graph goes for the exam is that what we're arguing here is a decrease in taxes should lead to an increase in aggregate, aggregate demand as well as increase in government spending and the money supply will all lead to an increase in aggregate demand. So what do Democrats argue then if they argue for decreasing taxes? Well they say that increase of taxes leads to a decrease in aggregate demand as well as a decrease in government spending and the a decrease in money supply will all lead to a decrease in aggregate demand and therefore output will decrease if we went from an initial aggregate demand to the decreased aggregate demand then our total output would have decreased so that's y2 y1 understanding the aggregate demand and how the money multiplier works. Essentially, an increase in the desi desired spending will shift the aggregate demand curve horizontally or to the right, and therefore, we will have more money. The way the money multiplier works is that 
if I have more money to go spend somewhere, I can go, let's say, to Walmart and the business of Walmart can hire more workers to pay them because I have more money to spend. Those workers that are hired or working more hours have more money to go to um, a restaurant. That person at the restaurant now has more money to spend at South Plains College. And by the time it goes circular back around, reciprocal, we see an increase in the total money supply. The total shift from A to C would be what we call the money multiplier or the multiplier. You'll see that it went from A to D in the example I gave with an increase in the money sp uh, spent because more people now have more money to spend on other things we'll see another increase to B to C. Money multiplier, the multiplier is the ratio of the total shift in aggregate demand to the initial shift in aggregate demand. Essentially it's just the amount that aggregate demand is increasing. So if we increase it by 10% and it increases by 20, we'd have a ratio of 10 to 20 or 1 to 2. The consumption function. This is a relationship between the level of income and consumer spending. Autonomous consumption spending. This is part of consumption that doesn't depend on income. In other words, what you're going to spend no matter what. And if you have more real income, you're not necessarily going to spend more on that. You might think of these as the necessities, the goods that you're going to buy no matter what, gasoline, your rent, your mortgage, clothing. Well, clothing that's necessity would be autonomous. However, the nicer clothing, more clothes, things like that would not be under the autonomous consumption spending. Now our marginal propensity to consume. You do not need to know this equation for the exam. However, you do need to know what it is. The marginal propensity to consume, the fraction of additional income that is spent. So in other words, if we consume more as, we in, as our income increases, we will have a high marginal propensity to consume. In the United States, we have a huge mar marginal propensity to consume. In other words, we're very materialistic. And let's just say that our, the amount we're going to buy is 100. We're going to buy 100 goods, let's just say, of tacos, 100 tacos. If I make $50 more an hour or 50 more dollars a day that's a ratio or marginal propensity to consume of two that means I'm going to consume two more items every time I get an extra dollar this ratio kind of dictates how our uh, aggregate demand is developed and our economy works we're very consumption driven and because of that, anytime we make more money, we're going to spend it. That money spent can be used in other words and other goods, and we will see a multiplier effect. The marginal propensity to save. Unfortunately, in the United States, we don't have a very large marginal propensity to save. This is a fraction of additional income that is saved. So if I had $100 I saved, When I got a raise of $200, sorry my writing is so bad on this PowerPoint screen, I'm on my computer and not my iPad, an additional $200 in income, this is supposed to be a dollar sign, there we go, well then I have a marginal propensity to save of 0.5. So in other words, every dollar I make, I'm going to save 50 cents, each additional dollar I make. Typically in the United States, we have a very, very, very low marginal propensity to save, at least over the last 30, 40 years. In the Great Depression era, though, it was much higher. In fact, in the 2000s, 
we experienced a negative marginal propensity to save. In other words, we spent more money than we made. Our marginal propensity to consume was so high that every time we got more money, we didn't save any of it. How the multiplier makes a shift bigger. This is just a simple table I encourage you to look at. Essentially, we increase the aggregate demand. What happens to the increase in GDP and therefore consumption? You don't need to know the equation for the uh, multiplier. Aggregate supply curve. So we've already talked uh, exhaustively about the demand curve. Well, let's look a little bit about a little bit at the aggregate supply curve, a curve that shows the relationship between the level of prices and quantity of output supplied. The long run supply curve. The long run aggregate supply curve is a vertical aggregate supply curve that represents the idea that in the long run, output is determined solely by factors of production. If you'll remember factors of production, if we look at it the micro, uh, macro level is just labor and capital. Human capital and effort goes into labor. Physical capital and natural resources goes into the stock of capital or capital. So this is what our long run aggregate supply curve would look like. You'll notice it doesn't look anything like the normal supply curve that we had. This is because in the long run, aggregate supply will just keep increasing, but output itself doesn't necessarily increase. It's independent of the price level. So if prices go up or prices go down, we will see in the long run an increase in output at the same rate. So in other words, if we were to combine the long run aggregate supply curve as well as the aggregate demand curve, we can see where the, the actual market equilibrium is. And because in the long run we're going to keep producing whether prices go down or up, because you're just going to keep producing, you're going to keep working, we will see that price levels will gradually go up no matter what. The short, short run aggregate supply curve, this is something that we're going to look a little bit more closely at. The short run aggregate supply curve states that it's relatively flat and represents the idea that prices don't change very much in the short run and firms adjust to production to meet demand. Remember that in the short run we stated that a lot of prices are, are very sticky and not that flexible. This is what it would look like. You'll see that it's more parallel to the ground, the short run aggregate supply curve. That's because what we do is we adjust to aggregate demand. And instead of decreasing or increasing price, we'll increase the amount supplied. Now, let's say that aggregate demand barely increased for this particular graph. And this graph represented the amount of students taking econ classes. What would happen instead of paying me extra or a significant amount extra, I would just work a little bit more, maybe get paid a little bit extra. If we saw a point, let's say aggregate demand increased more substantial, what would happen is that we would probably increase the price of t tuition but because it's relatively small increase we're not going to increase the price of tuition I will just work a little bit extra what factors determine the costs firms must incur to produce output the key factors and you will need to know this for the exam are input prices the state of technology so if we have better technology we're going to be able to produce more taxes, subsidies, or economic regulations. You know, it's really funny, and I know that I get off on tangents occasionally, but in this one, I, I think it's really humorous. 
our representative, let's just say it's Representative N for West Texas. I'm not going to give any names, just Representative N. He is against subsidies. And subsidies are essentially transfer payments. For instance, welfare checks or a subsidy for, let's just say, steel industry in Pennsylvania or the beer industry in Colorado or the orange industry in Florida. Well, Representative N is always against that because what we're doing is trying to manipulate the economy. And when we do that, certain businesses are able to lower their prices but also lower their production production because we're subsidizing part of it. Representative N, though, when it comes to cotton, he always is in support of subsidies. I find that humorous and a little ironic. Okay, back to the lecture. Taxes, subsidies, economic regulations, these are things that will affect the cost and production of businesses. For instance, if I have high regulations on my business, it becomes much more expensive. If I have high taxes on my business, it becomes more expensive. Therefore, I have to determine those costs and I have to produce where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Supply shocks. External events that shift the aggregate and the supply curve. We're going to quickly cover the supply side of the, the economy. This is the Republican side. Essentially, or the Republican ideolo ideology, what they argue, is that if we were to increase supply, what can happen is that we will have more wealth created. An adverse supply shock, such as an increase in the price of oil, will cause the aggregate supply curve to shift upward. This result will be higher prices and a lower level of output. Stagflation decreases in real out or a decrease in real output with increasing prices. So what the Republicans argue is that if we make it cheaper to produce, we will increase aggregate supply without having to increase price levels. We're going to cover that a little bit more in the next chapter but all I want you to see is that by decreasing prices we can keep the price level here even though we are producing up here and we'll have more money left over to hire more workers that's what the Republicans argue stagflation this in what I just talked about is a decrease in real output this is if prices just increase we're not going to produce as much because marginal benefit will hit much faster and we don't need to produce as many items. Going from the short run to the long run, you'll see if we go from here to here, eventually we'll get to a point where we hit the long run. At that point, prices will finally adjust. The idea behind Keynes' philosophy is that if we see an increase in either aggregate demand or aggregate supply without prices adjusting, we'll have some wealth. The next several chapters, we're going to look more closely at this as well as the supply side of the economy. Remember, that's the Republican view. The democratic view is what we looked at a little bit more in depth today. If we decrease taxes, people spend more. If we try to stimulate the economy by increasing the money supply, what happens to aggregate demand, as well as just increasing government spending. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. My email address is jkemper at southplainscollege.edu. You can follow me on Twitter at James Kemper or correction, I changed it, at Mr. Kemper. Thank you and have a great day.